Yeah, no, I think a really appropriate talk to, to, to pass on from. Um, <laughs> it's interesting, Duncan and I were sitting in a meeting a few weeks ago and we were chatting to our colleagues about this session and, and I think you'd, Duncan had said, for some reason, CIFRA decided they want to speak in this session. Um, and, and I think, uh, you know, CIFRA are not seen as an activist organisation. And I think, um, by some definitions, that's certainly true. You know, I'm, I'm not been out gluing myself to buses. Um, and, you know, I don't think we can really claim that we are one of the great champions of untold stories in, in archaeology. Um, not to say that there isn't a place for that and an opportunity for that through CIFRA, and we'll talk about that. Um, but I mean, I'm, I've been interested in, in activism for a long time, and, and I, have a, I understand it as a very broad thing. Um, activism is about a process for seeking change, and it has in my mind two elements, and that's about bringing pressure on decision makers, but also providing information, providing kind of answers to questions. Um, so activism certainly includes things like mass protest and boycotting and um, you know, legal action. But in the 21st century, activism is a much kind of more complex tapestry. Um, and there are lots of elements of advocacy toolkits for a whole range of uh, actors that, that are, in some senses, activists, or at least our activism is important. It's about raising awareness, influencing opinions, promoting interactions, um, and ultimately providing solutions. So I want to talk a bit about that kind of wider ecosystem for the act for activist activity, um, and why participation and engagement with CIFA um, is something that we really want to encourage. So um, I was going to do a little bit of history. Um, I'll probably skip over that because I think, as, as we've just talked about, um, CIFA's history and, and is enmeshed back in the, the history of rescue and, and other organisations back in the 70s. Um, one of the things that we wanted to very respectfully challenge um, in, the, in the abstract for this session, and I think probably respectful challenge is perhaps where CIFA sits in the, in the activist um, spectrum, is the idea of an established and establishment-led course for archaeology. Um, one of the things that always amazes me and, and quite saddens me in a way is how little agency people seem to feel about shaping the direction of their, their profession. Modern archaeology as a profession is, is so young, it doesn't have an established course. We're, we're literally making it up as we go along. And the history of our modern profession is groups of people getting together to make it up, to work out what to do next. There isn't, there isn't a rule book, there isn't a, a model really that we can, that we can base things on. Um, and that's something that, that, that I personally, and, and, and I think Rob agrees, would be very keen to, to, to change um, in engaging people with CIFA. So we go back to the 1970s. Um, it took nine years, I think, nearly ten years, to, from the creation of the Association for the Promotion of an Institute of Field Archaeologists to that institute actually coming into reality, based around concern, and a lot around um, non-publication of archaeological excavations um, in, those, in those early years. Um, it took another 14, 15 years before, before the Institute for Archaeologists was in a position to employ a, a full-time director. There'd been a, a company secretary <coughs> and company um, administrators up to that point. Um, and over those years, the role of the Institute changed um, quite, quite considerably um, to take on issues like um, pay and working conditions, campaigning against subsistence wages, which for those of you who don't remember, meant that people worked basically for, for travel costs and, and, and food costs uh, and no wages. Um, looking at archaeological contracts and looking at equal opportunities as well. I think if I've, I did have a look back through some of the archive photos and those photos of early um, IFA councils are, are very, very male dominated, like the Rescue Council. And I think this, this um, the picture on, on, on the left of the slide um, is one that I've taken from, from, from our office. It's travelled through various different office moves over the, over the, last, uh, the last 20 years or so. 
Um, and I think it arises from, from um, criticism of, of CIFA, that, that idea of CIFA always being an establishment organisation of the usual suspects. Um, and, and the point of this slightly doctored um, film post it was to show that actually that's, that's the IFA executive committee around 20 years ago. It was entirely female. Um, and certainly the interview panel that interviewed Peter Hinton as, as first director of the institute was an entirely female um, interview panel. So things changed. Um, lots of response to that sense of, of huge increase in contract archaeology, huge concerns around the sort of commercialisation of archaeology and what that might do to standards, but also um, working conditions for archaeologists. And leading to a name change um, from the Institute of Field Archaeologists to the Institute for Archaeologists to try and encompass a much wider group of individuals and eventually in 2014 up to becoming a chartered institute. So there have been a number of achievements over that time. I haven't got a sound effect on this. There was a great sound effect on my laptop. Um, primarily, really, I think around the processes um, for self-regulation and actually setting up um, a formal professional structure for archaeology um, and recognition for archaeologists within that. The extent to which all of these initiatives have been as in, as in, as successful as they as they wanted to be, the extent to which they've they've addressed the problems that they set out to address is, is, is open for discussion and is regularly discussed on all sorts of, of fora um, out there. But I think the main point is that for the most part, change is incremental. And it's very difficult, apart from when you have those key moments where something seismically shifts. We, but we're building building blocks all the time to create the profession that we that we have today. Um, that, as I said at the beginning, is a process that is undertaken by by the profession itself, rather than being imposed in a top down way by the establishment. We're by and large, as I say, making it up as we go along at this point. But. You know, 40 years into the process of um, establishing CIFA, um, it has become established. It has achieved this reputation such that there is a whole new generation of archaeologists entering a profession. And um, with that, there, is, there are challenges and, and differences in expectation when they look at this organisation that has been there seemingly forever. It's a chartered institute that has a particular image. And that's not always a helpful image because it kind of promotes attitudes of CIFA being a them rather than an us. And at the beginning of the process, it was about archaeologists banding together to create standards for the, for the nascent profession. And that's something that actually, it's really useful to have so that you can have for the profession um, a sense of shared purpose, a kind of commitment to that vision for beneficial change that we are still trying to pursue um, and to feel part of something. So, you know, my tongue is slightly in cheek there, but we've cut our long hair, we've purchased our red lightsabers and we've become the evil empire. Um, that's exactly what we're trying to avoid the perception. So... What we wanted to do is, say, is, is slightly challenge the view of CIFA being an established led institute. Um, the purpose of a professional body is to bring its members together to decide on the standards that are appropriate to decide based on, on our shared understanding of good practice, um, what, uh, what, what those standards should be and how we want to enforce them. That's the process of, of self-regulation that, 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 that CIFA engages in. Um, the, the diagram just sets out really the, the, the democratic structures within the organisation and how members feed into that process. And the key, the key bit of that diagram is the advisory council, um, which is elected, um, 20 elected members and 20 representatives of the, our special interest groups who are in themselves elected um, by their own committees. And that's a pivotal role, really, the advisory council. Um, it has its challenges. And I think there are, there are two there are two keys to challenges. This this structure is relatively new. It came in 
um, with the, the, the Chartered Institute in 2014. Before that, we had a, a much um, we had a single council with an executive committee that, that took the executive decisions about running running the company, as it were, that is that is the institute, um, the governance side of it. Um, so. The advisory council that we have now is intended to be much more representative. Um, it's the big difference uh, between that and the old um, council is that council members were, were the, the purpose of their role, they were supposed to represent themselves and um, contribute their own individual expertise to the running of the institute. The advisory council calls on its members to represent their particular constituents, whether that's through a special interest group whether it's through different parts of the country or indeed different parts of the world now as we have more international members. Um, so those advisory council members are tasked with, with reflecting uh, members' views back um, to, to the board of directors and, and by them to the, to the staff. So, so there are a couple of challenges with that. One is, is time, staff time. So um, to support that, that, that mechanism and make sure that it works effectively, uh, as with all small organisations, there's always far more to do than there are than there are staff to, to, to do it. And the other is increasingly the challenge on, on people's spare time to be able to devote to that as, as volunteers. So I think when we talk about the establishment, this is what the establishment looks like in 2019. It doesn't look like that anymore, um, thankfully. Um, not a bowler hat in sight. So Behind that group of people, and that's, that's the advisory council um, as it currently exists, is a very small body of staff um, supported by and underpinned by a much larger group of members, which I think actually if you bring in all the group committees, numbers in excess of 100 members feeding into that decision making process. Um, and we just wanted to have a very quick look at, at, at what two of those groups are doing um, and two groups that, that probably um, and I hope Hannah won't be offended if I say this, fit into that activist model, um, perhaps more, more, more That was the whole point of our group, so I'm pleased that you described it as that. Um, so the Diggers Forum, um, which has been founded for a while now actually, um, exists to try and support and represent the views of, of field archaeologists, contract archaeologists, back into that structure. And it provides a really useful sort of bridging mechanism, perhaps for those who might not otherwise think that membership of a professional body is for them. Um, and the Equality and Diversity Group, which has been one of our big campaigning groups, um, again, probably more fitting into that activist model, but I think, I think it would be fair to say in some ways that actually a huge indication of the Equality and Diversity Group's success would be if it ceased to exist, because it would have become the establishment. Those, those issues and those concerns would have been totally absorbed and taken on by the sort of central establishment that is is CIFA and it would have done its job. And that's the process that we see from activism into, into establishment um, as we go through the development of the professional body and developing the structures um, that we need to support it. So, I mean, so that's about activism within CIFA and how it's important to define the you know, direction of the Institute. And I just wanted to talk a bit about um, activism as part of the wider public affairs ecosystem within which CIFA sits and acts as an advocate for archaeology. Um, CIFA are essentially an interest group that represents a value community that is archaeology. Um, largely, we pursue traditional insider tactics when it comes to the lobbying things that we do. Um, by virtue of the fact that we are a small value community, um, we're always going to be a small interest group. Um, and so we have a challenge when it comes to creating the influence and access that we seek um, by virtue of the amount of pressure that we can bring um, to those people that we're trying to influence. So we're always in a situation where we need to earn political capital by building trust and respectability rather than a position to burn political capital by going out and protesting. Because we can't bring a huge amount of pressure by doing that. We've chosen that our best tactic as an institute is to build that respect, build that trust. However, there is a wider 
um, ecosystem that exists around us in archaeology and how we advocate for it. And that actually can be hugely um, reliant upon different kinds of tactics. Do you, do, do you touch, touch on this and, you know, the, the choices that rescue that organisation makes are different tactics, can be very helpful to us. Um, to touch on an example, um, a couple of years ago, uh, 2016, governments published a bill, um, neighbourhood planning bill. It don't need to go into the details of the changes that it made, but it, it had proposed um, a potentially dangerous change to the way pre-commencement planning conditions work in, in the planning system, which is obviously important for um, a huge amount of archaeology, um, how that is levered. Um, we picked this up, we had concerns, proposing and planning our, our insider lobbying tactics, but over the top of us, before we'd really kind of gone down that slow process, someone calling themselves Ginger Archaeology, who was a student from Winchester or something like that, had uh, put a petition online, pretty outraged, um, not entirely accurate, but, you know, fine. Um, and gathered about 10,000 signatures from social media over the course of a couple of days um, to the point that the then minister had to go out and tweet, stop atting me, we have not intended, we do not intend to damage archaeology. It had a huge impact, the kind of thing that we could not have done, the kind of involvement from a wide range of people on social media that we could not have yielded by our measured diplomatic tone. And yet what it did, it, in, it got the, the minister to inform his civil servant to come to us to say, could you come in for a meeting, please? We would like to discuss what this policy means and make sure that it is not damaging and it's less damaging um, as a result. Now, there are some risks and challenges involved in this model. Um, so there's a danger that it's harder to engage members in this style of advocacy. It's harder to um, get them to understand what we're doing and understand the kind of the, 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 the um, impacts that we're having. We also have a problem because we are a wider membership organization and as, as I say, an established membership organization now that there is this perception that people have to join rather than people want to join. And if we're not careful enough about making that communication to our members to cultivate their support, it's, it's damaging for the organisation and it's damaging for the message. We need better communication to ensure that engagement happens. There's a danger around vested interests because once you, once you start to achieve things on a particular um, advocacy uh, agenda, you create reinforcement loops and we have to make sure that through representation and participation in the organisation, through things like putting yourself forward to be part of the advisory council and bringing different ideas through, that actually the organisation is able to write itself if it gets um, pulled onto one track. Two linked problems, I mean it's possible when you're pursuing the kind of intake tactics that we do, that slow and incremental change is often hard to sell and easy to criticise. Um, it doesn't satisfy the more radical desires of those people who are in the profession. And then there's a danger that an organisation like CIFA can be outflanked in terms of its support um, through membership by those who satisfy those more radical concerns. And I think the, the, the way to do that is not to compete amongst your organisations. It's not so that this is an either or, but it's a both. Both types of tactics are required and again it's about building those positive relationships between organisations and I'm really pleased that actually I have regular meetings with members of, regular, uh, of um, Rescue Council now so that we can you know, share information and talk about these things. Um, and there's a suspicion of, of incorp incorporation you know, by the fact that I go to meet a Tory minister or sit down with some civil servants supporting a Tory government and that's not terribly popular amongst the membership that there is a, you know, a suspicion that we are cozying up to the establishment. And the thing that I would say that proves that that's not the case is that when Kate and I sit down for pints with people after advisory council, after tag conferences, we chat, we're on the same page 
I've never had an interaction with an archaeologist talking about an advocacy issue where we have not been on the same page with what we want. Um, and I think that's a real acid test for what your perception of CIFA as an organisation might be. So just to conclude then, why should you care what CIFA um, is doing and what CIFA activists are doing? Well, I think we would argue that if you consider yourself to be these things and you aspire to a profession which is those things, then you really should care. Um, there will always be a tension between grassroots activist membership and the establishment, the advocacy, the, 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 the policy side of things. And I think, by and large, that's normal and it's healthy. Um, we, should, we shouldn't be afraid of that. Activists will always want change to happen faster, um, and, that's, and that's right. Um, and as an organisation, CIFA needs activists, not just for the usual reasons that, that more members equals more resources um, and more influence and more ability to get things done, but also to make sure that those resources and that influence are being directed at the areas that CIFA members care about and, and, and that matter to them. Um, and as I said earlier, the advisory council is that bridge, bridging mechanism. It needs to be able to reflect those concerns and those views of members back to the board of directors and to the, to, to the staff. But it also needs to understand what the tools are at our disposal. There's no point railing against CIFA for not behaving like a trade union if you don't understand that it's not a trade union and it does different things. Um, so there's a really key role there in also reflecting back the role and remit of a professional body back to the members um, to, to reinforce those, those directions and those avenues for influence and, and, and the way that we can effect change. And I think if it's not too painful an analogy to finish on given recent events, I think not engaging with CIFA is a bit like not voting because you don't like the government. Um, it doesn't change anything. Um, so. I would exhort you to engage, um, and, and we're not far away from rescue store downstairs in the basement, so do come and, come and engage with us over the next couple of days. Thank you.